Our speaker today is Rick Moore. He's the president of the John McDougall Stewart Society and has an abiding interest in the exploration uh, of the pastoral uh, settlement of South Australia and Northern Territory. He has a, a rural background and has lived in the bush for much of his life. Although he admits he enjoys living in Adelaide in recent years, he spent around 60 nights a year uh, in his swag, I bet he's cold, <laughs> in the arid lands and with uh, a find it an excuse to light a fire um, and use the camp oven. He re he's recently been working as a guide with well-known outback tour operators such as Rex Ellis and Diamond Tina Tours. I, I invite uh, Rick to speak to us. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon to you all. I just want to share with you some of my thoughts about Australia, the continent, the landmass. And I want to challenge some of your thinking perhaps too uh, along the way about how Australia came to be recognised and then some of the leading lights in terms of exploration. So for those of us who thought, and I did for many years, that Australia was a concept of the Western Europeans, it appears that notion is wrong. And there's a lot of strong evidence to suggest that the Chinese came here, uh, possibly mined here on the East Coast, but certainly mapped the continent as early as 1421. Now, is that a fact that anyone had heard of or was aware of? That 250 odd years before the Europeans, or oh, hands up if you know the first, thank you. Hands up if you know who the first Europeans to chart Australia was. Not Captain Cook, you don't get any prizes for that. Hartog, wrong. It's Portuguese. Thank you. Yes, the Portuguese, yeah. So Australia, the landmass, has been recognised for a very, very long time. And these names up here are the sort of the leading lights who came towards it. When the Europeans settled here, and I specifically mean the Brits, as we know, they settled on the east coast. And on the east coast and in Tassie, there were a lot of short flowing, rapid, uh, high volume rivers discharging into the Pacific. And the thinking at the time was, if that's the case, maybe the continent needs to be balanced up in a sense, and there must be a lot of rivers heading to the west and possibly feeding an inland sea. And this concept of, of discovering or exploring the interior of Australia took hold almost as soon as the Europeans were settling here. There's a great big geographic riddle they're postulating that what is in the middle of Australia? What can it be? And the Western Europeans in that era were um, fairly full of themselves, I think you'd have to say. They thought they knew everything about every continent bar the Australian interior. They failed, of course, to recognise Antarctica as a continent, but you know that's only details, isn't it? So here we are. We've, we've got an age of exploration in the continental landmass of Australia. And some people thought they knew it all. Here's Thomas Maslin's map from 1927, where, uh, sorry, 1827. He's in England. He hasn't made it to Australia ever. But nonetheless, he's got a pretty good idea of what it might be. Now, I actually quite sympathise with his point here. He's drawn an inland sea because, as I said, there's, there's got to be an inland sea because that's where all the water's got to go to. But of course, by 1827, the Brits had mapped the outline, the perimeter, the coastline of Australia comprehensively. We know about Flinders and, of course, the, the Navy had mapped a lot of the north coast of Australia. And in so doing, they'd found the, the mouth of the Victoria River up there in the northwest, uh, just below the Australindian name that Maslin gives. So not an unreasonable thing, uh, you know, suggestion that there was a body of water feeding this great estuary. But that's the way this chap saw it in 1827. And these ideas became fashionable to talk about. They were of major interest in, in newspapers and periodicals and coffee houses. But here in SA, it was a little bit different. Now, we know we were set up as a colony in a slightly different manner to the rest of the country. But from here, a lot of inland exploration pushed north. 
and Edward John Eyre set out in 1839 to discover the inland sea. He couldn't because there was a ring of horseshoe lakes blocking his way. The other illustration here is of Hindley Street in 1840, because at that time Captain Charles Sturt was thinking about going to find the inland sea too. And he said, let any man lay the map of Australia before him and regard the blank upon its surface, and then let me ask him, would it not be an honourable achievement to be the first foot in the centre? So this is uh, Imperial Britain at its best doing the exploration thing. You know, Speak and Burton have been to the centre of Africa and found the source of the Nile. It, it's red hot gung ho stuff. They all want to be the hero. Well, there's a lot of things driving them. Partly the British paranoia about security in terms of, uh, you know, was there going to be a mutiny of India? How do we protect our empire? What about those wily Chinese? Are there commercial opportunities there? Do we need to develop this new thing called the telegraph? All sorts of things, but I'd put it to you also that a major driver for exploration was the rewards that come to those who first enter new lands, new to the Europeans. Let's recognise there was a, a nation, many nations of people living here before the Europeans came as well. So if you're going to be an explorer, why not ask the public what they think ought to happen? And the public said that a small army of explorers might cross the continent if well equipped and provided with an armed police force of Aborigines. Something might be done with balloons or pigeons. I, I don't know what, but something might. The water difficulty might be overcome by the use of a hose. Is this serious? <laughs> don't laugh. A party advancing into the desert could secure its retreat by planting melons on the way. So, you know, the, the good old Europeans, they knew a fair bit about it all. One of these said, and I was sharing with Tony earlier, uh, one of these gentlemen uh, said famously, I will cross Australia or perish in the attempt. And he did. And he was an Irishman called Robert O'Hara Burke. Someone else said, good heavens, did man ever see such country? And when faced with things like those fast gibber planes in the interior of the continent, you, you'd have to wonder. You really would, wouldn't you? So it was hard yards. And these, this is just a little shopping list of what I consider to be some of the greater Australian explorers. In terms of the sea explorers, obviously Cook, Flinders, and Bodan, who South Australia's got a strong connection to. But in terms of land, perhaps the one to draw your attention to is AC Gregory. And on the map up there with the red outline, that's Gregory's route in 1858. He was born in WA, he was a surveyor, and he was an intrepid explorer. Has anyone heard of him? One, two, three, four. John Seaton? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so there's a shopping list of explorers, uh, and they developed the continental uh, information base, if you like. Here's a quick summary of what it all looked like at the time when the uh, Brits settled on the eastern seaboard. 1836, as I said, that the South Australian colonies developed. They drew a line on a map, which happened to be the 26th parallel, because they knew a lot about the country back there in London, and said that's where it's going to be. And so exploration sort of filled in the gaps. It took a while to solve this riddle, what's in the centre? And the period I want to address right now is this sort of 1830 to 1880, 1879, it says there, around that period, because that's the time frame that the riddle is going to be answered. What's in the centre of Australia? So we're talking about explorers. Here's Ernest Giles' definition of an explorer. I'm not asking you to read this. I'll read it out for you. But an ex explorer is a man who, amongst his many uh, qualifications, must be able to make a pie, shoe himself or his horse, jerk a dog or verse or two, not for himself, but simply for the benefit or annoyance of others, and not necessarily for publication, nor even as a guarantee of good faith. And an explorer has to take and make an observation now and again, mend a watch, kill or cure a horse, make a pack saddle, understand something of astronomy, surveying, geography, geology, and mineralogy. Pretty straightforward, really, isn't it? What they didn't do is take this pill on the right. This is Dr. Hoke's pill, and it's a dehydrated water pill. So every explorer would be interested in that, wouldn't they? The instructions say, uh, for, for use, uh, add liquid, preferably gin. It's this stage that the little Scot, John McDowell Stewart, steps onto. 
Now, I shouldn't say little, because he wasn't little. He was about five and a half feet high, but in the day, that was the normal build of a man. And whatever five and a half feet is in metric, 155 centimetres or something, yeah, that's how high he was. He wasn't a big fella, but he was normal for the day. And he weighed about eight and a half stone. Again, normal. So a lot of us think these people were small. They weren't particularly small. It's just that, you know, nutrition has allowed genetics to expand the waistline and a few other things. So here we have Stuart, uh, a young man emigrating to Adelaide at the age of 23, who was orphaned very early in life and had been sent by family money to military college where he graduated as an engineer. It's not meaning he's going to build roads or skyscrapers or docks or bridges or things. He was really a draftsman and a surveyor. And he came from a little village called Dysart, just above Edinburgh, arrived here, as I said, and, and became a surveyor, hardly surprising. Now, the key here is surveyor, because we've got this new colony called South Australia wanting to expand its borders. But remember, our founding principle here is different to the others. That is, parcels of land are going to be measured, cut up, sold, and the funds are going to bring more people to the colony. We've, we all know that's the story of South Australia in the early days. Now, if that's the case, you need surveyors to measure the land. So the Surveyors General uh, Department uh, was a key uh, government body. And when Stuart got here, he worked for a bloke called Charles Sturt, who was the Surveyor General. And he spent a lot of time in the bush. Along the way, he went as third in charge uh, and the Surveyor Draftsman with Captain Sturt to find the inland sea in 1844-45. So he'd been here about 10 or so years, been out in the bush all the time, got to know the ropes pretty well. What he said later in life is these red words here. What is this great problem, the centre of Australia, where is it and what is it? So he'd identified, obviously he'd been with Sturt trying to find the inland sea, he'd identified a need to find out the answer to these questions and they puzzled him deeply. He was very determined that he might have a crack at it himself. So he resolved to make it the great aim of my life to accomplish it, it being the discovery of the centre of Australia. Now, at the time, and these are the words of Governor R.G. MacDonald, at the time, exploration was all about taking your bullocks and your water carts and your meat on the hoof, you know, oxen, sheep, goats, that sort of thing. But that was the way it was done. And in the 18, 1858 budget, $5,000 was put on the estimates to, to further explore the northern parts of the state. That's the way exploration was done. What Stuart did when he became an explorer was something entirely different, and that's why he was so successful. He went with men not of military rank. They were called his companions, and although they, of course, had a leader and subordinate roles, it wasn't a military operation. That's significantly different. And he had a, a, an absolute paucity of gear and equipment. So they went on horses. They went from geographical feature to geographical feature very quickly, very lightly, and the only way you do that is by being super tough. There are some key components. One of them is the horses. And the horses that he took on his last expedition were bred principally uh, in the Riverland at Cobb Douglas Station. One of his sponsors uh, bred them. And here they are, New Year's Day, 1861, leaving Stuart Creek to find the answer, can we cross the continent from south to north? It's all about the horses. Stuart's edict was the horses, the men, and him last. Always he was last. Along the way, as he's exploring north across the continent, he stumbles across a few major things that we value very highly today. And one of them is this series of mound springs, which, of, of which there's about 140 odd major groups, which in South Australia are the, the natural expression, the natural outpouring of the Great Artesian Basin. And these became the stepping stones, because as you know, if you've been up the Udnadatta track, it's desert. But these are the stepping stones that make sh lets passage happen. You can fall back to these waters. He got to the, towards the centre of Australia, above this 26th parallel, the, the border, and found this magnificent sandstone edifice. Has anyone been there to Chambers Pillar? Yeah, quite a few. It's, it's quite remarkable, isn't it? Uh, and if you get up on the Charlotte Range on the north side and you look and the sun's right, you can see all these ridges of sand hills and this blast of great stone sticking out in the middle. It, it's quite something. 
He and three of his men, two of his men, got to the centre of the continent and solved this enormous riddle, what's in the centre of Australia, in 1860, in April 1860. And here's Keckwick raising the flag, and Stuart's said, and he writes in his diary, he's going to bring the dawn of civilisation and the liberty and Christianity to these people, meaning the Aboriginal people he met on the way. Here's what it looks like in reality. So there's the artist's view. This artist, of course, never been there. Uh, but here's what it really looks like. The arrow is the summit. Here's my mate Dean, halfway up at eight, uh, 650 odd metres. And as Giles said, it was probably the very climax of desolation. If you've ever been to the centre of Australia, you can probably understand that sentiment. One of the things that also marked Stuart from his fellow explorers was the way his, he held relationships with Aboriginal people. And he, generally speaking, avoided them. And that is mighty peculiar. And he's the only well-known, internationally well-known explorer I've heard of or read about that did not use local guides and did not engage, wherever they could, Aboriginal people, meaning local people. And it's, it's a characteristic, characteristic of his that I've, I've been unable to, to solve. You know, why didn't he use Aboriginal guide? He did use one for two weeks in 1858, but apart from that, he never did. He maintained cordial relations for as long as he possibly could, and here they are camped north of Tennant Creek in 1860 with Stuart's tent suspended from a rope uh, under a tree. So a remarkable uh, tolerance for the day, remember everything's in context, a remarkable tolerance for connections with Aboriginals. But they were partly responsible for him having to turn back after he'd got to the centre of the continent in 1860. So what happened at this place, Attack Creek, and there's the artist's illustration on the bottom and the reality, my photo there. This is Attack Creek, where in 1860, Stuart, Keckwick and Head, the three men who discovered the centre of Australia, had to turn back because they've run out of tucker, they've run out of spare tyres, oh no, they called them horseshoes, but that's the equivalent, and the Warramunga people attacked them. So they beat a hasty retreat, and he, he rallied again and made it to the north coast two years later on the 25th of July, 1862. Here's a sketch by one of the men on the day where they've cut a hole in the mangroves to allow them through to see the sea. They've cut a mangrove sapling down and raised the flag, and they're about to head off. And the men, they've left Adelaide nine months to the day from straight through here, Montefiore Hill, where uh, John Chambers lived, that's where they left from, exactly nine months to the day. Here they are on the north coast, east of Darwin. And the man said, Mr Stewart, it's pretty successful, we've done it. They knew Burke and Wills were trying to do it. They weren't in a race, the Victorians and Burke and Wills were, but that's another story. But Mr Stewart, could we please have a cup of tea to celebrate? And Stewart said no, which would appear, I think, to be churlish and mean-spirited, wouldn't it? But in reality, Stuart was, he was petrified they weren't going to make it back. He knew their rations were so tight they couldn't afford one more spare cup of tea. He was very worried about the health of the party and himself, and uh, they did make it back. But it just shows you how tight things were for this particular explorer. When I say they did make it back, poor old Stuart got carried 600 miles in this stretcher because he was so debilitated from, well, basically he starved himself for 10 years. He did a very good job of being on light rations and he just couldn't sit on a horse. So they carried him 900 miles back to civilization. And the route that they established is the route we still use today through road and rail and train and you know all those sorts of things too. But what happened to the man? Well, he went to England two years after he returned from his crossing, his successful crossing to the north coast, and he died two years later. He was a bachelor. He never had a relationship that we know of with a woman. Uh, I don't think he was otherwise inclined. There's no evidence to suggest that either. But he, he died and was buried in this grave in Kensal Green, which is near Notting Hill. And the spire in the top photo was dislodged sometime during World War II. It, it wasn't bombed off. It was it lying intact in the grass. And in 1954, the Royal Geographical Society of South Australia started a movement, a push, to get the spire replaced. But it somehow had gone missing. So 1954, the RGS starts this little project off. And I'm happy to say 
that we, we being the Stewart Society and the RGS, finished the project in 2011. But you know, we got it done. So there was now the spire back on the grave. Poor old Stuart had a, a shopping list of illnesses, but I mentioned malnutrition, but scurvy, beriberi. He probably had a duodenal ulcer. He smoked a lot. He was a binge drinker. He had dysentery. It, you know, there were all sorts of things that might have caused his death, but he did die. His legacy is what counts. He solved the geographical riddle. And interestingly, because of what he wrote in his diaries, the portion of land above this 26 parallel was ceded to South Australia in 1863, and it became known as the Northern Territory of South Australia. SA couldn't handle it, essentially. In 1911, the Commonwealth Government resumed control of it. But along Stuart's route, the Overland Telegraph went, and this was a nation builder. You know, there's only a very few nation building activities that we've, we've done here. Maybe the Snowy Mountains and the Murray Irrigation Scheme's one, but certainly the Overland Telegraph is another because it connected Australia electronically, if you like, to the rest of the world. It was of enormous importance. And Stuart's route, of course, became the highway in World War II. And the railway line, which he wrote about in 1862, he, in his diary, is saying this would make a good route for a train, obviously didn't happen for another 140 odd years all the way through either. So it's a strong legacy, and perhaps the, the final bit is the formation of the John McDowell Stewart Society, which happened here in Adelaide uh, in 1964, founded by people who were connected to, through family relatives, of the companions of Stewart. Stewart had 33 companions in all on his journeys, his six expeditions, and some of their uh, Descendants decided they wanted to honour Stuart and they formed the Stuart Society. And so the society's uh, a vibrant, strong society, it has very good links with uh, kindred societies here and overseas. And we have about 150, 180 members. Let me just finish by saying that here's a definition that fits our little man. Oh, I've said it again. Our man, Stuart. The best explorer, according to H.R. Mill, who's Annis Shackleton's. Um, Biographer Ernest Shackleton would probably be one of the five or ten greatest ever explorers. But Mill said the best explorer is the man who can both conceive and dare, who carries his organising committee with him on his own feet and knows that there is no one to blame for his failure but himself. To such an explorer is due on his return the undivided praise for plan and execution. So I put it to you, that's exactly what Stuart did. He was Australia's greatest inland explorer. Oh my God, he smiled right at the end. A Scot smiling. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Has anybody got any questions? No? <laughs> The first camels came to Australia in the 1840s, there were five. One of them famously shot John Ainsworth Horrocks up near, um, above Port Augusta, uh, and that was the end of that until Burke and Wills imported some in 1860, and then Thomas Elder uh, got some more in 1862. Camels changed everything about exploration in Australia, but it was only from 1860 onwards, and Stuart had no access to them. But th they're the vital thing about filling in the blank. Any further questions? Did anyone die on these expeditions? No, on Stuart's ex expeditions, no one died. Um, the contrast is, of course, the Burke and Wills exploration where eight died. Uh, but uh, it's a measure of the man and his skills. It's, a, it's the cup of tea story, I told you. Very careful, very thoughtful, very measured. It means survival. Do we know the cause of the incident at Attack Creek? Heavens, that is a really tough question to answer. Yes, Europeans were invading Aboriginal land, but it's a lot more complex than that. But that's probably the short answer. The Warramunga, I think it's fair to say, have a reputation, both from an Aboriginal perspective and a European perspective, of being extremely aggressive, hostile. And uh, that's where it happened. You could write a paper on that. <laughs>
Philip Jones did, our, uh, the, the uh, senior ethnographer at the Adelaide Museum. Any further questions? The contrast between Burke and Wills and Stewart? One succeeded and one didn't. <laughs> That's a major contrast. The deaths, the manner of, of the operation, you know, Burke and Wills. The, Burke and Wills is a, a nickname. The name of the party is called the Victorian Exploring Expedition. Uh, and they uh, took £60,000 to fund their expedition, which failed and had deaths. It's a comedy of errors. And it's kind of interesting that we celebrate it, isn't it? Is this a characteristic of our national personality? Is this the first time we're celebrating failure and the next one might have been the Anzacs and so on? Is this the tall poppy thing happening for the first time publicly? Where Stuart, who was extremely successful because he changed the way he travelled, you know, he went quickly, he didn't take everything with him, he didn't have the dining room table like Birkin Wills, he didn't have the rum with which to treat the mites on the camels, which Burke and Wills had. Well, we didn't have camels, unfortunately. He, he would have been better off with them. But uh, there's a lot of contrast, but I think success and failure will do. <laughs> now, there was a question. Yeah, now, the question was, I mean, I left Southern Europe to come to Australia because I thought I wanted a country run by Anglo-Saxon with the weather we have in Southern Europe. But, so I even made this premise. Why do you think the Portuguese and the Dutch are more interested because there was nothing here they could grab. They were interested at that stage in spices. Spices are the, are the liquid gold, you know, the really high commodity things. They can sell spices for up to 10,000 times their purchase price. So they go to Malacca and the Straits up there by Java and they can fill their ships with this and go back to Western Europe and sell them and make a lot of money. But if you sail, courtesy of the, the uh, Roaring Forties, eastwards and hit that West Australian continental edge, it's cliffs and horrendous country inside. There's almost no water. There's the story of the Batavia, the wreck, uh, where, where murders, complex relationships broke down and more murders, rescues, an awful place to land. So I think the driver is, it's too hard. And Peter Neutz, the Dutchman, got to um, just near Sejuna, as we know, turned around again. Why did he turn around? Well, he hasn't seen anything of value to a European, has he? So I think that's probably the answer, but it's a pretty good question too. I'm, I'm not sure that's the only answer. Yeah. So why didn't they go across the top of Australia, between the islands or something, around the top, going to the country? Well, somebody of them country. did go across the top of Australia. Well, some of, the top of Australia. some of the Portuguese, uh, Torres, I can think of, and some of the Dutch. Uh, so th they did, but you know they're driven by different ideals. England's unloading, a, a, onto, you know, it's a penal dump for goodness sake. And they're just out to get whatever they can out of the place. They've set some settlements up on the north coast, as I said, they all failed. They don't understand the environment. The seasons are upside down. So they all want different things out of this landmass called Australia. But the Chinese had it all mapped. They knew. They were mining. Incredible stories. Thank you, Rick. I found that very interesting. Um, and I found another point very interesting before the meeting. And that was, you have followed on from... <coughs> um, that was, hmm? Sir Douglas Mawson. <laughs> I, my grandparents lived next, next, next to him and I knew him very well. And you've covered on. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.